Hi guys, welcome to the Coffee Break Interview Video Podcast. I'm Dr. Nathan Ho, and I'm your host today. Today, our special guest is Dr. Edward Zuckerberg. He is the father of Mark Zuckerberg, who is the founder of Facebook. Welcome to the show, Edward. How are you today? I'm great, Nathan. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you so much. Uh, it's such a privilege and an honor to have you on this video podcast. So thank you so much. My pleasure. For, for, first of all, I'd like to say that Facebook is an amazing platform uh, and I use it for my dental practice. I use it to connect with so many amazing dental professionals. And the matter of fact, you and I got connected on Facebook. So uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. So tell Mark that, that I say thank you. I will. You're currently a, a consultant and CEO of Painless Social Media. Uh, but before we, uh, we go into social media, let's start with your career in dentistry. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey in dentistry in the early days? Uh, so I graduated NYU Dental School 40 years ago in 1978 and um, did a general practice residency at the Brooklyn Veterans Administration Hospital and then went into uh, private practice in Brooklyn, New York for a practice that I had for about 11 years, but about six months after starting that office, uh, I got married. And ultimately, about a year later, my wife got into medical school in Westchester County, New York. So we migrated up to Westchester, uh, uh, resided in a town called Dobbs Ferry, New York. And um, the, we bought, actually bought a house from a retiring dentist. Okay. So I think a decision that was probably the best uh, decision I made career-wise for both professional and family reasons um, was practicing in a home-based situation. So uh, I commuted for about 10 years and ran two offices, one in Brooklyn, one in, in the house which didn't involve a commute other than to walk downstairs. <laughs> That's awesome. And, uh, from 1990 on to 2013, when we actually sold the office and, and the home in New York, I practiced exclusively in Westchester County. So uh, having an office in my house enabled me to, um, you know, be home for dinner with my kids, always be around. It gave my wife some flexibility to pursue her career in psychiatry, uh, allowing me to be home, you know, when the kids got home from school and handle any crisis at home if she was away. And uh, ultimately, she opted to leave psychiatry and ran my practice from within the house, which actually had a tremendous amount of use for her psychiatric skills, let me tell you, both the patient, staff, uh, myself, my children, <laughs> we all benefited from her training. I bet. <laughs> so, so I always had a very strong uh, um, bent for technology. Yeah. Uh, I, had a, I had a math background, but not a computer science background. Uh, but one of my earlier uh, classmates in dental school convinced me, I want to say back in like 1977 or 78, to buy an Atari 800 computer. <laughs> and it had some very primitive programming thing on it for a language called Atari Basic. And in my free time, I love to play around with that, you know, making, creating like databases for everything from uh, coin collection to record albums and whatnot, stuff that I could probably more efficiently handwrite on a notepad, you know, yeah. and, and took like four times as much, but creating it using computer programming just really excited me. Yeah. And, um, you know, back in 1985, when the first IBM PC XT came out, I took, dragged my wife to the, IBM store in White Plains and bought this really piece of garbage computer. I mean, it had uh, a 10 megabyte hard drive and 512K RAM. I mean, that, that device wasn't big enough to hold one of today's pictures from a high-end digital yeah. camera. Yeah. And, and, um, and yet it ran my first practice management software system in 1985. 
$5,000 for the computer, $5,000 for the software. That was a lot of money in 1985. And we didn't have a lot of money. I mean, my wife had just finished medical school yeah. and we were paying her medical school education, paying my minimal student loans and trying to make ends meet. And I just, certain pieces of technology like that just grabbed me. Yeah. And, um, it was awful, but it was critical for learning, developing a learning curve, learning from the shortcomings of the software and the hardware, what to look for in further iterations. Yeah. So, so, you know, I always encourage people with a bent for technology to not be afraid to get in early because, you know, oftentimes if you wait too long, you just completely miss the boat and everything's over your head before you know it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great advice. So w w when I read your bio, I realized that you always embraced uh, a, a digital future in, in your dental practice. Uh, so you bought your first computer in 1984, right? That's when Mark was born? 84, 85, yeah, in that yeah. era. So, so what, what was your vision back, back then uh, for, for technology? I, I mean, my vision was just to use it as like a dependable employee. You know, someone who hopefully didn't call in sick and who didn't make mistakes and things of that nature. <laughs> a, 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 a very slow employee, right? Because the computer was super slow back then. A little bit steady. <laughs> I mean, employees weren't that fast either. <laughs> yeah. but, but for sure, they, uh, that, that employee would show up to work, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, hopefully, yes. Yeah, so um, can, can you tell us... Uh, about your philosophy on the business of dentistry, what do you think is the best way to grow a dental practice and to be successful? Gee, um, well, you know, it's all about being patient-centric. Yeah. I mean, uh, you can, there's lots of different ways to build a practice. Uh, I came into dentistry in the, at the dawn of the dental insurance era. Yeah. And I built, my first office in Brooklyn into a full-time practice from a startup practice in six months mm -hmm. by virtue of being willing to work with and accept, accept assignment, work for some flat rate plans. At that time, the New York City teachers had a Cadillac of dental plans. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were on a fee schedule with no annual maximum. They paid pretty much 100% fees their fee schedule was higher than some of the fees i was charging wow <laughs> and there was, it was absolutely a no-brainer and, yeah. and unlike worrying about billing a patient and not getting paid for 90 120 or whatever days you know in those days nobody came into a dental office with a credit card or a checkbook yeah uh, it was bill me doc you know that kind of thing so it, i found insurance companies to be a very reliable way to get paid, uh, you know, a steady stream of income. Yeah. And uh, my flexibility where other existing long-term practitioners didn't want to deal with it. You know, it was like, oh, this new, I got this new insurance doc. Can you do this? And while well, you pay me, I'll fill out the form for you and you send it in and get paid back, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and the reluctance of the older dentists to work with patients who are just coming into this newfangled form of dental assistance enabled younger dentists like myself to plow in. Now today, um, we have this, these new beasts. We have PPOs and HMOs, which are basically insurance company ways of saying, hey, you're going to be an employee of ours now. You went to dental school, you're three, four $400,000 in debt, but you're our employees. We're going to tell you how much we're going to pay you. Yeah. We're going to tell you what procedures you can and can't do. We're going to generally make your life miserable, and just suck it up. Yeah. So if you want that kind of practice, you can get a full-time practice pretty quickly. Um, but you're going to work really hard and not make a lot of money and find that you're compromising care, and you're going to be probably a pretty miserable individual. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but if you take the time to build a patient uh, base from scratch through – good skills, you know, the old fashioned way, hard work, um, real, you know, white glove service to patients, treating them like people, 
treating them the way you want them to be treated, um, being sure your skills are honed, you know, as best they can be so that you can de deliver high quality care and deliver it painlessly. And that became, that became a key focus of my practice. Um, you know, when I, especially when my wife got, uh, came into the practice, um, I mean, very early in my career, I said, I complained, I love what I do. I love dentistry. The patients don't like to come. <laughs> then, you know, even when I do great work for people, you know, I, at the end I get, gee, you know, thanks doc. You know, I hope I don't see you again for a long time. You know, <laughs> that kind of, and, and that can be kind of depressing for us as dentists, you know, people that are coming to see you, even if you're a nice person, you take good care of them. They're generally not happy to be there. Yeah, you're right. And, um, so together, she and I really started trying to break down what makes the dental experience unpleasant. Mm. And we really looked at everything. Yeah. I and mean, we interviewed patients, or she did anyway, at length when she was in the office. What don't you like about going to the dentist? So there were some people that just had bad experiences. And there were certain things that triggered their memories of their bad experiences in youth. Yeah. Things like people wearing white coats, you know, got associated with being in a clinical environment. So yeah. my office being in my house, um, we all wore regular, you know, clothes, you know, ultimately, obviously, you know, protective gown wear over them when you're treating the patient, but in between patients, we're all walking around in casual polo clothes, that kind of stuff. stuff. Um, smells. Yeah. People said the dental office has a terrible smell. Of course, that would be, um, when I was first in practice, it was common practice for offices to make up batches of eugenol. I never figured out why you'd have these big vats of ZOE paste. You know, mm -hmm. was it really so hard to do same day dentistry? You know, but ZOE paste was used for everything. So yeah. temporary crowns, place temporary fillings. And the, and the eugenol just stunk up the office. You know, not necessarily a, a bad smell uh, if you're in the profession, but to a patient, it was a smell that equated with dentistry. So yeah. no eugenol, no smells in my office. <laughs> um, no fiberglass, you know, lots of homey stuff. Um, my kids would come into the office. You know, we were friends with a lot of the patients. It's all part of the home office setting. Um, and then, obviously, pain. Pain to the needle. Learn, learning how to give quality, painless, and, and uh, efficient dental anesthesia takes time. Yeah. Especially with a lot of kids. I had a lot of young kids in the practice. So it would often be a whole process where, you know, you dry the mucosa, bathe it in topical anesthetic. Um, then when you've got a little bit of, little bit of surface anesthesia, just give a bare pinprick, deposit a couple of drops below the mucosa, sit and talk to the patients, wait a few more minutes. Now they're now, now go in, give the, 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 uh, the full anesthetic effect. And, and while it, you know, if you're on a PPO and, and you're working for 60% of what you should be working for, you can't afford to sit and schmooze 10 minutes while you're waiting for the anesthesia. So it's boom, anesthesia, go to work. You know, that hurts. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, I mean, and, and, I, and for real phobic patients, you know, we had TENS units. I mean, those are really time consuming. You put a couple of pads, you can put a pad here, a pad here turn on the, uh, the vibrations, you know, the patient juices it up over the course of three to four minutes, the muscles go into fasciculation, you know that they're not feeling anything between here and here, and you go in and give local anesthesia uh, then. You know what? But effective. Um, noise, mm. okay, so we switched early, as early as we could, we switched to electric hand pieces that didn't have the high wine. We had, um, custom headphone experiences where the patients could choose. Uh, we used a Novatone system. They could choose from 
five different musical selections, classic rock, comedy. Comedy can be rough hearing a patient, you know, laughing hysterically during <laughs> a procedure. Of course, things like nitrous oxide for those that needed it and stuff like that. So we really tried to zoom in on what made patients fearful of the dental process and conquer it. And it was really rewarding. And what that did to me was that for me, that essentially made my practice recession proof and PPO proof. Because when someone's a terrible phobic and they find a dentist that they trust and they're comfortable, who doesn't hurt them and things don't fall out. I mean, they really don't know how good we are. Yeah. Those are the keys. Did it hurt? Does it look good? Does it not fall out? Yeah. Uh, obviously, we need to strive professionally for high quality, but the patients don't necessarily appreciate that or really understand that. Um, oftentimes, not until they go to an, a successor dentist after you retire or they move or something, and someone says, wow, you've got really good dentistry in your mouth. You had a good dentist, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, th yeah, thank you so much for giving us uh, those tips because usually we know that patients appreciate us when they like and trust us. And most of the time it's, it's the smell, like you said, it's the smell, how clean the office is and whether the injection hurts or not, right? Because yeah. um, right now we, we have uh, some patients that drive uh, two, three hours to see me. And, and it's not because of, uh, of, of, of my crown or or veneer, or, 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 or my, the quality of my work, but instead, it's usually, it's the shot, it's a painless injection that I, that I did on them. So those are, those, those are the things that dentists, as, 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 as practice owner, can do to grow the practice, and it usually doesn't cost them anything, right? You know, I'm afraid that more, more and more today, a dentist is like a commodity, you yeah. know, like you lease a car and you change a car every three years. Um, yeah. A lot of people will do that with dentistry. They don't really perceive the value of yeah. that. I yeah. mean, I was in an office and I was helping them convert um, from a PPO practice to fee for service, uh, full fee for service. And um, the practice, as a lot of practices out here in California, have a lot of patients who are on Delta Dental. Yeah. And Delta Dental is probably one of the more uh, insidious PPOs in terms of, you know, mandating fees and, and not compensating dentists reasonably and putting unreasonable restraints on the practice of dental care. And yet, when the doctor kind of took some of my advice but didn't use my implementation methodology to do this, and kind of just like said to patients, oh, well, you know, we, Delta Dental's not keeping up with inflation. We can't afford to accept their benefits anymore. So um, from now on, we're not going to be on Delta Dental anymore, but we'll fill out the forms for us and we'll continue to take good care of you. And they had patients that were just flying out the door. Mm. It's like, oh, no problem. I'm sure we'll be able to find another dentist who accepts yeah. Delta Dental. Yeah. Some of them who were very wealthy, affluent patients doing yeah. that. Yeah. So that tells me that the practices are not um, really building value yeah. and making that connection with the patient. That we're not just another dentist like the guy or the gal on the corner or next door or in the same building. You know, there's lots of dentists around there. Yeah. And unless you do something to distinguish yourself and develop lasting bonded relationships with your patients and show value. Um, yeah. You can't be changing employees every couple of weeks. You can't be, uh, you know, going on vacations all the time and patients coming in not knowing who's taking care of them on a given day. That's not the methodology or the formula for, you know, a really high, highly successful dental practice. Yeah. Uh, before we get into uh, social media, I wanted I wanted to ask you uh, one one more question for the newer dentist. So, if if the new dentist wanted to get into practice ownerships, what are the steps that they should take? Because these days the the student debt is usually really high. It can go anywhere from three hundred to half a million dollars. So, so what are some steps that they should take? I know they're not supposed to buy so many fancy technology that costs 
eighty hundred thousand dollars. So what what are the steps that, that you can uh, uh, advise that you can give to uh, these uh, new dentists? Uh, you know, we're 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 actually at a wonderful time now mm. um, for new dentists, even though the costs are very high. I think I just spoke to a colleague of mine whose son is um, going to our alma mater, NYU Dental School. I believe the costs are now exceeding a hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like that could be enough of a deterrent mm -hmm. to go to dental school. But assuming you've made that career decision that you want to go to dentistry, hopefully you're doing it for the right reason. Yeah. When I went to dental school, 50% of the 200 students in my dental school class had parents who were dentists. Mm. So them going to dentistry was probably preordained. Mm. You know, and for many of them, maybe they had a practice to walk into. Yeah. So, that made financial sense. Plus the fact that my three years of dental school in 19, from 1975 to 78 cost a total of $20,000. <laughs> it was a great career choice yeah. and, a great, and a great financial return on the investment for your education. Yeah. Now, um, especially with the, climate, the startup culture out here in California, um, I think it's, Probably, if all you're looking for is high income, it's probably not a great choice. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> we found a scorpion. I think oh. <laughs> it's not dead in our in our bedroom. Oh my welcome, goodness! Welcome to living in California. Yeah, we New York native. boys from Brooklyn didn't see those. Yeah, not native. <laughs> we just got back from a Disney cruise with our grandson. Um, we were down in San Diego and then a two night cruise to Ensenada, Mexico. And I'm wondering if he stowed away in our luggage somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, but, glad, I'm glad you didn't get bit by that scorpion though. <laughs> but anyhow, getting back to young Dennis. Yes. So I think that, um, the opportunity is that a lot of dentists probably postponed retirement. Mm. A lot of dentists were probably playing, you know, we had a huge um, incorrectly perceived manpower shortage in dentistry that forced dental schools like NYU to go to three years instead of four to churn dentists out quicker. And then I think at some point we realized that all the dentists were going into um, high density population areas, and we really had, were not solving the problem of the underserved areas. Yeah. So, uh, one thing right away is there's still great opportunities going into lower population underserved areas. But even in metropolitan areas, you have dentists my age, a lot of them, dentists who are in their uh, early 60s, who are now in a position finally after two financial crises, one in 2001, another one in 2008, that probably set back their retirement, who are probably finally going to retire now. Yeah. And so I think the ideal opportunity, and I can paint the scenario that happened in my career as a perfect uh, thing that, that young dentists should look for. Yeah. So I always had associates working for me in my practice. And it was a way that when the physical um, challenges of the profession started taking a little bit of burden on me, you know, when you get past 50, your eyes aren't as good as they were. Uh, fortunately, I still have solid, steady hands, and I still actually go into the office here in Palo Alto and practice roughly about one to two mornings a month. Not too often, but <laughs> enough to... Uh, treat some family and friends and also get called in to consult on specialty cases every now and then. So I like that. That's uh, awesome. But, you know, back, neck issues, things of that nature. And so what I did was I started transitioning to working about three days a week. And that kept me going for a lot of years. And, and it actually made practice that much more enjoyable. Mm. giving me time now when my kids hit college age to be able to travel more with my wife and um, pursue things like uh, I, I play professional, I play contract bridge 
um, which I find very stimulating for the mind. Uh, uh, photography, a little bit of golf, you know, things of that nature. You know, mixing in pleasure with business, um, you know, lets you enjoy practice more. So there were always associates in my practice. And then my children started moving out to California. So Mark moved out here in 2004 um, when he started Facebook. Um, about a year and a half later, he talked my older daughter, Randy, who was um, who graduated from Harvard in 2003 and was working in marketing for first Ogilvy and Mather and then Forbes uh, in in New York City. He convinced her to come out and run the marketing department at Facebook. And then uh, my youngest daughter, uh, I have three daughters in addition to Mark. Uh, my youngest daughter went to Claremont McKenna College in Pomona in Southern California. And after graduating in 2011, she got a job with a startup um, company in Palo Alto, California. So now we have three of our four kids in California. Uh, that still didn't get us there. We had one going to grad school in Princeton. And... Um, Ultimately, what happened was Randy had a, a child. So in 2011, the first grandchild was born, and my wife was holding that baby, and she looked at me and said, I'm staying. Are you coming? <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, my God. You know, we, you know, we talked about it might happen at some point in time, but we, we really didn't have a timetable. So yeah. now I have this full-time practice and a home in New York. And so I've got this gal who was working for me for four years. Terrific lady. Patients loved her. Um, she was there as much as me oftentimes. Uh, a lot of people probably thought she was already a partner in the practice. Yeah. And um, making a reasonable living, you know, working on an associate salary. Um, single mom, too. So a great setup for her to have a home office, right? With her yeah. girls in the house while she's working. Uh, and, and, but for whatever reason, she didn't feel like she uh, had the skills to be a practice owner. Mm. So it didn't work out, which yeah. was a shock. Oh, man. And, and, and ultimately, I hired two more associates to come to work for me with the hope that one of them would ultimately, you know, when I hired them, I didn't hire them just as associates. I hired them with a mindset that if you like this practice, I want to seriously discuss, you know, you, this is an ownership opportunity. Yeah. So, um, one of the guys who was really good, um, I mean, he was on three days a week. He was probably earning close to a quarter of a million dollars. Wow. So he was really producing, good high quality dentistry at a good rate yeah. and um, my accountant drew up you know actuarial numbers for him how he could buy the office buy the house with it and pay off the debt and still generate the kind of net income after handling the debt that he was earning as an associate yeah and it sounds like a no-brainer, and yet we had a heart-to-heart -heart talk, and he said, you know, I've got like $400,000 in paper from dental school and college, yeah. and I just can't physically bring myself to signing more paper. Wow. Um, so that um, really gave me an insight into the mindset of the dentists coming out of dental school now who are in debt, but, I, I, you know... I guess the long, the short answer to the long answer I gave you to your question is that I don't think it's feasible for new dentists who already have a lot of debt to build their own office from scratch that doesn't come with a patient base because yeah. it's terribly expensive with all the technology that you need to buy yeah. to out an office now. Yeah. And I think the, the opportunity is there. There are dentists like myself who have practices with streams of income, who can create flexible buy-in situations, you know, where instead of a lump sum, you know, we're happy to take back paper and make it in a, 
in a fashion that can give the retiring dentist the stream of income in their retirement yeah. and make payments that are affordable to a new dentist, even one who's in debt. And now you come into an office that already has the high tech technology, has the equipment, has a stream of patients producing income. You can slowly make changes if the dentist practice methodology didn't meet your methodology, introduce new techniques and whatnot, but slowly make changes without, um, you know, strapping yourself because you have the income stream coming in from the patient base. And probably the biggest advice I would give is even if you don't agree with the way the dentists were in the practice, change things slowly. slowly. Patients are creatures. Patients are creatures of habit. Yeah. They've been coming to that practice. You may hate the staff. Don't just whoosh, fire mm -hmm. everybody and bring in all new staff. They want to see the same faces at least for a period of time that they can get comfortable with you and develop some trust with you. And now you can slowly make the changes to the practice to suit your needs without... Um, putting a potential dagger into your financial flow. So I, I think that associating with an older dentist or buy-in, buy-out situation or, you know, something like that is the way to go because of the tremendous cost of technology and setting up a dental practice. Yeah, that, yeah, those are great advice because uh, these days if, if they come out uh, of, of dental school with a debt of four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars and and then start a, a startup that costs another maybe three to five hundred thousand dollars. That's almost a million dollars. And with five, five, six percent interest rate, it's, I, I would imagine it's very hard to, to, to make pay, uh, monthly payments. So uh, those are great advice. Uh, let's let's talk about uh, marketing real quick for for Facebook. I think five or six years ago, uh, or maybe longer, you can create a a Facebook business page and uh, for for your business. But after that, you have to have a personal page in order to create a, a business Facebook page. Is that correct? Um, well, you always need to have a personal page. Yeah. Uh, sign into the personal page and then you create the business page from that. And, and it's interesting because I get a lot of, especially in the early years, I get a lot of kickback from people that, you know, really don't understand it. Yeah. They don't understand that you can have a personal page, you have a business page, and they are not related. Yeah, they're not. There's no cross-posting. There's no, um, just because a patient is a fan of your business page doesn't mean they can see content on your personal page. There's yeah. no mix at all. It's yeah. The personal page is merely a point of logging into your account. A dentist doesn't, he can set up a personal page and never do anything with it. Yeah. Never has to never has to accept any friend requests, never has to post any content, just uses it as a means to log in if they if that's what they want. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people don't understand that. In fact, my kind of second career, if you want to call it as a consultant, was launched back in 2010 by of a bad Facebook mistake made by the father of social media in dentistry, Dr. Howard Ferran. Yeah. And Dr. Howard Ferran formed uh, Dental Town. God, I don't know what the year was, but I know it was way earlier than Facebook was around. Yeah. I mean, that was really the first social network for dentists. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Howard was really ahead of his time. Yeah. And um, I did not know Howard personally. Um, I had never been to any of Howard's lectures. And I, I, sometime in the middle of 2010, I got a call from Howard. Um, for those of you who don't know the evolution of the process of Facebook pages, Facebook site itself first started in 2004. And for a couple of years, it was basically college students, then high school students and businesses. Didn't really open to the public until 2006. Um, Pages for business didn't start until 2008. Yes. So uh, in the early years from 2008 to 2010, very few dentists were adopting business pages for their practice.
But Dr. Fran was on a mission to become friends with every dentist in the world. <laughs> and, um, unbeknownst to him, he set up his page, which would have been suited as a business page. He set it up as a personal profile. <laughs> so he was actually requesting dentists to be friends. <laughs> and some of them were requesting him. Yeah. So you, know, you got to actually reach out to someone, find them, send them a request. They have to accept it. It's like a two, like a handshake, we call it, you know, a request and an acceptance. Yeah. Um, whereas with a business page, there's a like button on the page. It's, it's a one way street. You know, someone wants to connect with you. They click the like button. They're in. They don't, you're, you're a business is extending the formal invitation or informal invitation for anyone to just like the business page and now be connected with that page. So Dr. Fran set up his page as a personal page and he rather rapidly in a short period of a couple of years reached the friend limit request for a personal page of 5,000 friends. <laughs> and Facebook was sending him a message, you can't have any more friends. <laughs> and so he, he just read an article about Mark, found out that Mark's dad was a dentist and... Um, searched me out, called me up, and um, said, basically, Ed, Facebook won't let me be friends with any more dentists. I want to be friends with everybody. <laughs> and I quickly figured out what Howard had done wrong and, and found that there was a conversion program that we could run to convert his um, personal page into a business page. Mm. And all those people became fans, and now he had – the ability to have an unlimited number of fans on his page. Yeah. He was so thankful. And he said to me, I want you to write an article for dental town magazine. Um, does my office need a Facebook page? So I wrote the article. <clears throat> it was very well uh, received. And a few months later, the, the team there asked me to, uh, I think the editor at the time was uh, Ben Lund asked me to write another article. Um, something else that I was passionate about in my dental practice. And I said, well, you know, I've always been an early adopter of technology. So I wrote an article a few months later, I think it was called um, uh, Integrating Technology in the Dental Practice or something like how I learned to uh, put down the sledgehammer and love my computers. Huh. And then funny things started happening. I started getting emails. I started getting phone calls. Um, initially from some dental schools, some major dental conferences like the Washington State Dental Conference in Seattle asking me to come speak. And I had never, I mean, I had done some low level like CE meetings for companies like Orafama. I used to talk about Arrestin at like dinner meetings for like 20 or 30 dentists, you know, while we were having steak at Ruth's Chris or something like that. Um, but I'd never spoken in front of a large audience. Yeah. And um, I didn't know if I would enjoy it. I didn't know if they would enjoy hearing me. I didn't know if I had worthwhile to, things to say, uh, things of that nature. Turned out the answers to all those things was yes. Yeah. And, and I enjoyed it. And it, kind of happened simultaneously with my wife's hitting me with the fact that we're now moving our base to California from New York. Ah. So uh, while that transition took two years, and during that time I spent 50% of the time away from New York, either in California or traveling to give talks, uh, I kind of launched my semi-retirement or second career have you. So in, and in those early days, our talks were pretty much on getting dentists to launch Facebook pages because dentists didn't have Facebook pages back then. Yeah. So we actually do live creation using the internet during a talk of setting up someone's Facebook page, showing people how to set it up. And, and, and then that evolved to now where everyone's got a Facebook page and it's like, well, you've got a page, but you're not doing it right. This yeah. is how you've got to do. This is how to do it right and get yeah. into more of the finer points and nuances on it. Yeah. So uh, speaking of uh, every dentist uh, now pretty much uh, has a Facebook page, but some of them are not doing it right. So can you give us some, some tips 
for uh, for dentists to uh, market their practice correctly on on Facebook. Not not only to market, but also to connect with their patients. Well, the one thing that dentists have to understand, um, if they dabbled with a Facebook page early, like 10 years ago, yeah. or eight, seven, eight years ago, um, they were probably used to um, getting about an 80% reach on their post content. Yes. And that's because Facebook was young and in its yeah. infancy, right? Yeah. Now, with um, the average fan, the average person on Facebook has like 250 friends. And then like maybe another 75 businesses. Yeah. Um, you've got 325 sources that are potentially pushing content into the average user's newsfeed. Yeah. So if dentists don't do anything um, to, to really play the game and get their content viewed up high. Yeah going to be pushed down so low or not seen at all that their actual penetration of their content to be seen by their base is going to average something like about five percent yeah so you could work hard to get a thousand fans of your facebook page and only about 50 of them are going to see your content yeah that's a big lost opportunity yes so um the algorithm that facebook uses is geared to organically um, promote content that gets a lot of engagement. Mm. So if you've got really interesting content that's getting people to comment on or click on or interact with or share, that, um, that post is going to earn um, high marks, high scores in the, um, the edge rank algorithm that Facebook uses and Facebook's going to want to push that up higher because they know it's good, valuable content. Yes. So then it's more likely that your fans will see it. Yeah. But if you've got ordinary content, you know, that may not resonate that well, you can still get it seen by viewers by boosting the content for money. I mean, let's face it. Facebook's a public traded company. They need yes. to make money. Yes. And the only way they make money is with advertising. Yes. So you can play the game of <clears throat> buying your way into your potential viewers' news feeds. And it's not as expensive as people think. Yeah. I mean, simply boosting your posts for $5 a post. I mean, if you're doing only one or two posts a day, you know, at that rate, you're probably spending only a couple hundred dollars a month, less than like $2,500 a year yeah. uh, on a Facebook marketing campaign. Hell, I used to spend over ten thousand dollars a year on yellow page print ads. <laughs> you know, New York being a Z, yeah, I was like on page fifty of the yellow pages. You know, so if I didn't buy like display ad contents yeah. that put me in the front of the yellow page section, no one would ever find me in the yellow page. Yeah, yeah. You know, unless they accidentally open the book from the back. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Uh, so I, I realized that in, in a couple of years ago when, when I posted something on Facebook, we got about a couple hundred likes, right? Or, 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 or a, a lot more comments. But these days, whenever I post something, I only see maybe about five likes and only hundred seen the post, uh, even though we, 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 we have close to a thousand. But so are you boosting? Are you boosting the content? Yes. yes. So and right now, right? Yeah. Right now, uh, just like what you said, I, I I boost on some posts, and I try to I try to make the post more uh, personal uh, and, right. and and something that people would engage in, right? Because uh, one time we hire a company to automatically post some content on there, and right, usually right. we only have maybe one or two likes, and and usually uh, either either. Either my dad, my seventy-eight-year-old dad, or, or sister like those posts. <laughs> <laughs> so even even though it's a business Facebook page, but I, I try to post something personal uh, so people yeah, would. Enjoy. Enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So fool around with stuff, see what gets. So so here's what I recommend, and here's a valuable tip. Yeah. So so it's always best to have content that will get engagement on its own, even without boosting. Yes. And what you can do is say, try all kinds of different content. Yeah. 
Um, don't boost. You may not want to boost them immediately. Yeah. After a few days, look at the analytics on Facebook, on the insights and analytics page, and see which of your posts are doing better than others organically. Yes. Because if the post is interesting and getting engagement organically on its own, it's going to do ex exponentially better to boost those posts yeah. than the others. Yeah. And, 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 you, can, you can boost them all and maybe spend an extra five bucks on the ones that are organically doing better. Yeah. If they're doing, if they're doing well on their own, they're going to do even better when they're boosted. Plus, boosting a post gives you the ability when you pay. This is a big one. Yeah. Okay. If you're watching at home, write this one down. This is the pearl from this podcast right now. Yeah. Okay. The target demographic when you go to boost the post should be friends of who like the people who like my page and their friends. That's a great tip. And their friends. Awesome. Every one of the people that likes your practice has an average of 250 friends on Facebook. Okay. Got it. So when you go, when you spend money, you're going to go beyond just the friends in your practice. Got you're it. Go, you want to go out to their friends because <laughs> now when your content appears in someone who doesn't know you from a hole in the walls newsfeed, yeah, they're going to also see embedded in that post the name of their friend that likes you. So they're going to see Edward Zuckerberg. Or they're going to see John. My friend John likes Edward Zuckerberg DDS. There's an ad for a dentist, or they don't know it's an ad. Some people know it's an ad. Yeah. It looks like every other post. It's yeah. an interesting piece of content that's hitting their newsfeed. Yeah. And it says, it's whatever my marketing message is. And on top, it tells them the name of their friend that already likes my practice. Yeah. Uh, hey, John likes Edward Zuckerberg. You know, I, I've been meaning to look for a new dentist anyway. He's good enough for John. He's probably good enough for me. What, what, what it's essentially saying is John says you should use Edward Zuckerberg as your dentist. That's yeah. what it says. It's, it's a, when you get someone to like your page, you're essentially getting the endorsement of them to market to their 200 average of 250 friends on Facebook to like you also. Yeah, that's basically. And to choose you as a dentist. And the only way you can get to the network of the yeah. people who like you already, who like your page, yeah. is to boost your post and run ads. Selecting fans of the page and their friends as your target audience. That's great advice uh, because um, that, that's almost like word of mouth but in a digital form right absolutely and 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 one of my early um social media menti mentors a guy by the name of dave kirpin who started a company with his wife called uh likable media and they eventually had a product called likable dentist mm -hmm. um and dave actually quoted this feature as word of mouth marketing on steroids yeah yeah on steroids and and, and, and basically, it's, uh, it's also like uh, social proof. Once you have the social proof from the people that likes and follow you, 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 you use that as a leverage to reach the friends and family members around your practice area. Yep. So here's my number two pearl, okay, right. which is kind of related, kind of related to that. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, have you ever been, this is a silly question, I know the answer. Have you ever been to a restaurant where the food was so outrageous that you pulled out your phone and took a picture of the food and posted it on Facebook. Me? No. Yeah. You've never done that? I never done that. Even oh though I God. wanted, I, I wanted oh to God. sometimes. I want to write bad reviews sometimes, but I, I try to hold back most of oh. it. <laughs> the, the, food, the food in Texas must not be that good. Don't, don't write letters to me now. <laughs> so, I, so I was in, I was in um, Morimoto's restaurant in Las Vegas in June. And for dessert, they bring out this fiery, flaming chocolate tort. Okay. It's yeah. Kind of, like, kind of like Cherry's Jubilee, you know, whatnot. Yeah. They set it on fire and whatnot. And we had seen a few people get it before us. Yeah. Everybody was pulling out their phones, taking yeah. pictures. So I did that too, more for lecture material 
yeah. than anything else. Okay, and I created a post on Facebook and checked in at Morimoto, and basically all my, my friends saw this picture of this chocolate tort at Morimoto, and they're writing, oh my God, that looks amazing. Um, I can't wait to go there and try that and whatnot. Yeah. Free business for Morimoto, right? Yeah, yeah. A recommendation from me. Yeah. You know, if my friends think, you know, I. You can't see my whole body, but I can tell you I don't miss many meals. <laughs> and, 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 uh, I'm a little bit of a foodie, so um, people like my food recommendations and generally. Yeah. Uh, so, so for me to recommend Morimoto, I mean, they should have caught me on the dinner. You know, they yeah, didn't. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know. So, so I got to thinking that why don't dentists encourage patients to check in at their office, okay? Mm. Because when someone checks in at a location, this is very different than an advertisement. Yeah, this is tip number two, right? When you, yeah, when you create a post and then boost it, mm -hmm. the only place that that post lives is on your business page's timeline, right? Yes. So only people who like the page have the potential to see it unless you market by boosting to their friends or go out to other demographics by, by advertising. Yes. When someone checks in about at, at a business, that content is going not on the business page, but on their personal page. That check-in goes in on their personal page, which means that their network of friends, their potential 250, now I keep using the number 250, you know there are people with over a thousand friends on Facebook, and you know there are grandmas in your practice that probably have twenty or thirty. Yeah. You know, people they've reconnected with from college that they haven't seen for forty years, plus their grandkids, and that's yeah. it. So they're not as valuable from a word of mouth marketing standpoint as the people that have a thousand friends on Facebook. But I use two fifty as an average amount. When someone checks in, if you can get someone to check in at your office, they're essentially telling their network of 250 friends that they're in your office. Yeah. Well, why are they in your office? Yeah. They're essentially screaming out, I'm yeah. here and you should be here too. This yeah. dentist is great. I love yeah. this dentist. You should go. Okay, now we don't serve fiery chocolate torts in my dental office. So we need to figure out other ways to do it. So yeah. um, some of the things we, uh, a few years ago, okay, here's a great story. Um, you know those little one ounce sample size of toothpaste that you get in the mail? We used to get them in my office from Aquafresh. Yeah. Every yeah. month we get 36 one ounce things of toothpaste. Yeah. And um, the hygienist would take out take them out and put them in a, her bag that she would give people at the end of their visit with the toothbrush and floss. One day, UPS guy comes up the stairs with a hundred cases of Aquafresh toothpaste. So obviously somebody yeah. made a big mistake. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now we've got a hundred cases of 36 toothpaste. And my first thought was, well, let's donate these to like, churches and synagogues that do like midnight runs for the homeless. And then I said, well, let's hold some back and do a check-in promotion. Mm. Put up a sign and when people come into the office, check in on Facebook and get a free case of toothpaste. I mean, who wouldn't want a free case of 36 one hour? I mean, that's like, those are like perfect for a vacation. I mean, that's yeah. like, you're set for vacation for the rest of your life. Yeah. 36 one outside the toothpaste, right? Oh my gosh, you offered right. a whole box. <laughs> 42 people in one week, 42 people grabbed that offer yeah. and checked in on Facebook and told their network of friends about us. And our numbers for pay, new patient referrals the next month were through the roof. Then we were averaging like 20 to 25. We had like 60, 60 and 70 the next couple of months. From yeah. that, just from that. Wow. Day, Check-in thing. Yeah. And, and, and the, the most ridiculous thing is one woman came in with a friend of hers who was getting a tooth pulled to drive her home. 
Yeah. And she saw the promotion and said, can I get a free case of toothpaste too? The receptionist said, of course, you just have to check in on Facebook. So now we're potentially getting 250 new patients from someone who's not even a patient of the practice. Wow. But her friends don't know that. And they don't know she got free toothpaste. All they know is she checked in. Yeah. And she liked that office a lot to tell her friends that she checked in at yeah. my dental office. Now, my office had in the wall 300 gallon saltwater aquarium between two operatories. Yeah. Really spectacular. You know, the hygienist from one side and her patients, me from the other side, my patients, spectacular. Also part of the, um, the, the phobic thing, you yeah. know, distraction yeah. and whatnot and re- relaxation thing. But people would pull out their cameras on their phone and take pictures of the fish tank. Mm. And they're going to want to share that mm-hmm. with their friends, right? Yeah. I see this cool fish tank that my dentist has in his yeah. dentist. You know, and maybe they'll check in to do it. Yeah. But but the key is to figure out some kind of giveaway promotion to incentivize people to check in at your office. You know, maybe it's a kiosk in the waiting room that they get to take a picture and they put like Instagram filters on it, you know, with mustaches and funny faces and then text it to them and it's embedded with your practice data and now yeah. they're going to share it on Facebook and let people know they were in it. Yeah. Or some kind of giveaway. Yeah. You know, I, something relatively inexpensive. Yeah. I have an idea already. Tomorrow, right. Starting next week, because I have two practices. Tomorrow I'll, 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 I'll practice at a, at a smaller practice. But starting next week, I'm going to buy a vase of roses and, and make up a sign Check in to receive a rose. A rose. <laughs> a lot, a lot, uh, yeah, a rose. A lot of people like roses, right? Especially okay. uh, I, I, women. I got, something, I got something here that's a pretty good idea also. Let me show you this one. <laughs> that's, that, that's, that's, that, that is a great idea because what I realize is uh, re- refer patients uh, or a patient that... Have you ever um, seen one of these? Uh, what is that? I said the back side of uh, some something. No, it's, it's the front of a. It's called floss time. This is dental floss. Oh, okay, got it, got it. Okay, um, so you mount this in your bedroom wall, on you know on the mirror behind the sink. Uh huh. And uh, let's turn it on here. Okay. And you press the button. <laughs> that is 18 inches of dental floss, okay, which you could then cut. Yeah. It's got a cutter in there. Perfect strand. And yeah. I don't know if you can see, but it's blinking blue around the periphery. Yeah. And now it's smiling. <laughs> so, so if you go 24 hours without flossing, okay, this thing um, turns red. What? <laughs> there, see, it's frowning at you in red now. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and I have mine set up in a two-person mode so that my wife and I can both use this to floss with. And so, God forbid, the right side where my side is is blinking red at night and hers isn't. <laughs> hey, Mr. Dentist, you didn't floss in the last 24 hours. I'll never hear the end of it, you know? <laughs> so, the reason I bring this up is this product, which is called Floss Time. Um, I happen to be an advisor for the company, Shameless Ploy. Uh-huh. But I think when I first time I saw it, I had the idea. This is an amazing giveaway. Yeah. In promotion. Yes. Because okay? these things cost as little as ten bucks. Oh yeah. And, and, and I mean, they they cost more, but the company. Um, makes cartridges that go on the inside that the patients then have to buy from the company. So it's like giving out the razor. Yeah. Uh, so, so the company is kind of willing to work with dental offices and supply them for pretty much cost. So for 10 bucks, imagine having one of these on the wall in the hygiene operatory in your practice. And at the end of the appointment, the hygienist dispenses the hits this button that dispenses floss and the patient goes, Oh, that's really cool. And the hygienist looks at them and says, 
Would you like one of those to take home for free? For you at home? All you got to do is check in on Facebook here at the practice. <laughs> okay. That's a great idea. And now the patient checks in and their 250 friends don't know that they got a free floss time. All they know is they checked in at your office. Yeah. Wow, that is a great idea because I realized that uh, patient that endorsed by uh, other patients are usually the best type of patient to have in the practice because they almost already trust you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, um, what, what other tip do you have for Facebook marketing? Because I realized that uh, it's all about creating social proof because sometimes we have patients that came in because they saw our ad on Facebook and then they went on our, uh, they went on Google to read our reviews, and then they and then they call our office, and and when they come in, usually they usually said, uh, I, I, you know, I saw you out on Facebook, and I read all your reviews, and I I, I trust you. Uh, so, you tell me what I need. Uh, I'm, I'm running out of time, but I'll leave you with one more pearl. Yeah. Okay. So, juicy tidbit number three. Um, have you ever now? You're a bad example because you've never checked in at a restaurant. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Have you ever shopped for something on the internet? Yeah, all the time. That you didn't buy. That you didn't buy. Uh, like maybe yes. you went to look for like a suitcase yeah. on Amazon or something. Yeah. You didn't buy it. No. And then. They follow you, me. <laughs> it follows you around the internet afterwards. You yeah. can't get rid of that suitcase is following you around until you buy it. Yeah. The company that. Uh, sells the suitcase, knows that you didn't go yeah. to the store to check out and purchase it. Um, they know that the live conversion of customers from website to sales is as low as 2%. Yeah. Same thing applies to dentists. When pe We work hard to try and spend a lot of money on like website design, search engine optimization, to get potential new patients to take a look at our website. The number that actually go to the website and then convert to become new patients is a lot lower than we'd like to think. It's below 10%. Yeah. Okay. But once they visited the website, why start the marketing cycle all over again if they didn't buy by looking at the whole broad market? Okay. Why not keep going after them like that suitcase manufacturer or sales store did? And so your website, whether your web host provider is doing it or not, has the ability to track people who visit your website. Not just your main website, but if they, you have like a sub page like on implants or something like that, yeah. They don't know who went to the implant subpage. So now they don't know their name, they don't know their email address, they don't know their cell phone, they don't know anything. All they know is their device ID number, their IP address of their iPad, iPhone, uh, desktop, laptop, whatever device they use to get onto your website, they know. Yeah. And um if you can follow up on that, and you can, or so why, why can't your web host provider say provide with you on a monthly basis? Here's a list of all the IP addresses that visited your website this month. Yeah. And now maybe, maybe you had 50 visitors to your website, just to use a round number. Yeah. Well, now import those IP addresses into, uh, into the file that the web host provider gives you and create a custom audience on Facebook mm. free Facebook yeah. doesn't charge to create custom audience. No, so it, you no. have a custom audience and label it website visitors. Mm. Is, that, is that different from uh, retargeting the, the visitors from your website? Because on well, Facebook, that's what you do it. That's yeah. what you do it. Yeah. Basically so now you're creating an audience of people yeah. on Facebook who have visited your website. Yeah. And now you can run a campaign to them. Yeah. Knowing that you're not out there seeking out cold turkey people who might be interested in your services. You're marketing specifically to people who have already been to your website. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So I find that um, retargeting is a tool that dentists are not 
using. They seem to be using it in all other businesses, but dentists don't use it. Awesome. So, uh, uh, okay, I have, I have a couple more questions, but how much time do you have? I'm running out of time. I got like five more minutes maximum. Okay, five, five more minutes, right? So um, uh, t- can you tell us a, a little bit about, f- about uh, Facebook Live? Because what I've been trying to do is to go over some clinical cases. Uh, uh, of course, I have to uh, uh, ask my patient for, for, for the permission first. But I, I, I'm, I'm planning to do some Facebook Live on before and after clinical cases or use a software to uh, show or edu- educate patients out there how we can yeah. transform uh, or improve a smile. So what do you, what do you think yeah, about great that? Great idea. Great idea. I mean, people love video. Video yeah. online gets tremendous amount of interaction on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, and limited only by your creativity. So I had an orthodontic office that decided that they had a patient that had just finished Invisalign. And they, um, they did a Facebook but the patient was so happy in the chair. And, and, you know, in the old days, when the patients were thrilled with treatment, um, you would just smile to yourself and say, oh, good, there's a good chance I'm getting paid. You know, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Nowadays, we think testimonial. Yeah. Got a live body who loves us, who's thrilled with their treatment. Let's get a testimonial. Yeah. So they, they pulled out their, someone pulled out their iPhone and they started doing a Facebook Live of this happy patient with a nice smile. But it didn't have perspective. And the audience is spontaneous. Whichever fans of the Facebook page happened to be on their phone and got a notification that that particular orthodontic practice was now live and tuned into the video, got to see the video. Mm. So maybe a pretty small audience. Yeah. So they said to me, hey, we tried this and it didn't really work that great. You know, what ideas do you have to, to maybe do it better? So what we came up with was we decided to schedule a Facebook Live. Mm. So we had a known end date for a, a case, you know, be it an Invisalign, be it an implant, be it co- co- whatever the case was. Um, orthodontics is, lends itself beautifully to it because the before and afters are extreme. Yeah. You could, veneers or cosmetic makeover yeah and what they did was they created a post with the before pictures of the patient you know with the malocclusion and the crowded dentition and whatnot and they discussed in the post that the patient was undergoing invisalign therapy and that tuesday morning at 11 o'clock the patient was going to be live in the office and if you're contemplating invisalign this is your chance to, to come view the thing. So some people actually put it on their calendar, you know, to, to be ready for the 11 a.m. live, you know, Facebook broadcast coming from this office about Invisalign. Yeah. So those that tuned in now saw the patient live, saw the finished results, saw the after. They were able to write messages to the patient, asking them questions about the treatment. Um, the, the engagement was way up. Yeah. Um, they, they did other incentive, incentive things during the week to promote the Facebook Live broadcast, like um, announcing a, a code during the live broadcast that people could then use for like $100 off the Invisalign treatment. Yeah. They the code and that they saw the video. Um, other offices are using Facebook Live to do things like um, promoting new technology. Yeah. So it's an office that just got a, CAD CAM machine or, or, or something like that, you know, might give a demonstration and tour of what this machine's capabilities can be doing a live broadcast. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, last question. So uh, I think your son, Mark, is doing an excellent job in trying to connect everybody in, in the world and, and change, changing the way we communicate and as well as helping small business owners to market and connect to their customers. What, what is your vision for Facebook as far as for small business owners in the next uh, five to 10 years? Um, I mean, I don't have a personal vision of it. You know, I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not on the brain trust end of things, but from what I see going and what they're doing, I see more use of the, um, of the messenger, Facebook messenger, the messaging status. Yes. 
as a new way that offices are going to utilize uh, patient communication in a manner that um, respects the time of both the staff and the office. Yeah. So, so office that's live in the office is dedicated to, to um, servicing patients who are in the office at the time they're there. Yeah. And so, um, you know, scheduling people's next appointment, taking payment, you know, answering questions about treatment, presenting treatment plans, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Things like routine appointment requests, um, requests for bills and, and, and things of that nature can be really well automated to, to serve the patients better and, and to, you know, better allow the staff to in the office to treat the patients who are in the office at the time. So I see more things like, um, you know, scheduling appointments through messenger, uh, making payments, you know, and things like that through a messaging program, uh, you know, which is really just an offshoot of Facebook. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for, for your time. Before we end this interview, do you have any last word for our viewers? Um, just use the tools that I gave you today. Plus, um, there's a great website called Blueprint. It's mm -hmm. facebook.com slash blueprint, where um, it's probably the, the best thing that nobody knows about because there's tons of short how-to five to ten minute videos on almost everything you need to do to learn how to use Facebook efficiently. Got it. Thank you so much, Ed. Uh, thank you so much for your insights and wisdoms. We really appreciate you for sharing your journey and great advice with us. And I also appreciate everyone for watching this Coffee Break interview with uh, Dr. Edward Zuckerberg. Until next time, take care.